As, as we continue in our series in Invested, last week I told a story that was personal um, about my choice in college. I talked about um, Tim Green, who was the, um, the dean of religion at Trevecca, and I, I talked about how I went to different schools, and I met with different um, deans of religion, and I was trying to figure out where I wanted to go to school. If you were here last week, I'm sorry you're hearing this again, but I needed to tell it for anyone that might not have been here last week. And so I was going around, I was, I was trying to figure out where I wanted to go to school, and all of these people are telling me all the great things about their program, but Tim Green did something that nobody else did. He said, I want to stop, and I want to pray with you that God will reveal his will to you. And in that moment, like, that was something that just, it, it changed me. It changed my thought process. And, and I became so aware that, that, that Tim Green was not just in it to get another student. He wasn't just investing to get another person in his program, but he was investing because he really cared about me and he cared about the kingdom. So I tell you that again because I want to tell you another experience I had in college with another professor. And so I was in class one day. There was a professor I had. I'm not going to use his name. Um, he's a good guy. But I, I was in his class, and he was one of those professors that he liked to play devil's advocate. He liked to throw some crazy things out there. He liked to get arguments going. And he was a brilliant guy. I mean, he almost always, you know, made us look silly because he knew so much. Uh, but, and, and he would even say, like, if you, the more you engage in the conversation, the more that you debate back and forth, the better your grade will be in this class because that's active. So one day I'm in class and he throws something out there that's, that, that's you know, kind of off. And one of the senior religion major guys in the class spoke up and said, I don't agree with that. And they started something that happened just about every day. They started this back and forth discussion in class. And the thing that was different about this day is it became very clear that the senior religion major was right on this discussion. And it became more and more clear as they, as they went back and forth that, that this guy had a really good point. And, and I think everybody in the class was thinking, yeah, like, that's absolutely. And I'll never forget, after class, that professor called that student up to his desk. I was walking up there probably because I was late writing a paper or something. That's usually why I was walking up to the professor's desk. But I was walking up there. I heard him call the student up. And he said, don't ever speak in my class again. Never again. And I thought, what in the world are you doing? Your whole calling, your whole goal, your, your purpose is to teach us. And, and you tell us that the most important thing is that we engage. But the second someone comes at you and it looks bad for you, you shut them down. I tell you that story not because I think that guy's a bad guy. He's a good guy. But I think sometimes, and I want to contrast the two, I think sometimes when we invest in people, like Tim Green, we invest with the right reasons and we invest to build the kingdom. And I think when we do it that way, when somebody's invested in you and you know that it's not just about a number or a statistic, but they care about you, it it changes you. It draws you closer to Jesus. But if we're investing with our own agenda, with our own desire to build our brand or, or protect our reputation or whatever it is, if it's about our agenda, that changes us too. But it doesn't change us to make us more like Jesus. It draws us away. And so, I, once again, I... I think sometimes people get off track. I think sometimes you and I get off track and maybe we know what's right and we're trying our best, but sometimes we get off track and I'm gonna chalk that second story up to the fact that, that, that my professor was probably a little bit off track today, but, I, but it stuck in my mind. I never felt the same way because I understood that one of these professors cared about me, cared about the kingdom, and the other, I still believe, cared about me, but but seemed like he was maybe more interested in his job, his reputation. 
And so I want us, as we talk about investing, to understand that investing in others is not just a job that we do. It's not just something we do because we have to. Investing in others is a calling from God. We are called, as, we are, as, as God pours into us, as we grow, we are called to take that and invest into others. And so when I look at those two stories, I know who I want to be. I know how I want to invest. I want to invest in people so they know that I love them and that it's not just about me and it's not just about my agenda, but that I, I want people to, to see Jesus through the way I interact with them. See, great teaching, great knowledge, great arguing or debating, it can teach you something. It can help. But the thing that really changes people's lives are when they know that we love God and we model that love by investing in them authentically. And so, I want us to, to just, today, I, I mean, I want us to hear from God. I, I'm going to tell you a little bit later, I, I really did feel like I heard from God last night. I'm going to cry. It's going to be good. Because I, I'll get to it later, but I really believe that there's something that, that we need to talk about today. And that's our investments. And so, so we're going to continue looking at 1 Thessalonians. We're going to look at chapter 2 today. But, but I want to set the stage again and, and, and tell you that this is Paul and Silas had spent a little bit of time in Thessalonica. They had invested in the church there. They had preached and taught. They had led people. And, and last week we, we looked at chapter 1 where Paul says, you know that we lived this out. You know that... that we were an example of everything that we were preaching to you. And so Paul and Silas were there in Thessalonica and things got difficult, but, but God was moving in incredible ways. People's lives were being changed, but then things got difficult and they ran them out of town. And so this letter we have is Paul writing back to the church of Thessalonica, the people that he had invested in, and trying to encourage them and push them forward. So we talked last week about living the gospel that we preach, about setting that example. Let's look at chapter 2, verses 1 through 7 together. He says, You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi. As you know, but with the help of God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. So, once again, I want to set this stage. Paul is writing this letter back to the church in Thessalonica. He is, he's poured time. Some people think he, he preached about three weeks. We don't know exactly how long he was there. But he had invested in the people of Thessalonica. Lives were changed. And what he's addressing right here is after lives were being changed and after he's preaching to them, the people in power, the government and the religious people, started to feel threatened by the gospel that he was preaching and by the fact that there were results. And so they ran him out of town. But they didn't just run him out of town. They tried to discredit him. They tried to break down what he had done, his investment. They, they tried to get rid of what he had done. And so, so Paul here starts this, this portion by saying, you know that our visit to you was not without results. Now, there's a couple ways you can look at this. You can look at this as a man who is defending himself, who's defending his reputation, defending his work, a man who's got his own agenda, 
But if you're looking at it that way, I think you're missing this whole thing. See, I I think the reason Paul writes this, I think the reason Paul reminds the people of the good things that God has done, I think the reason Paul says all of this stuff is not to make himself look good, but it's because Paul really loves these people. And he really doesn't want these people to lose the God and the gospel that they've accepted. Because as people are trying to discredit him, as people are trying to tear down what he did, they're trying to tear down the people's faith. And so Paul writes this, and he's, he's further investing. This isn't him trying to make himself look good. He doesn't need to do that. He's writing this because he really cares for the people. And he wants to help them continue to grow in their faith. So he's further investing. The th- There's several things I want you to see. The first thing I want you to understand, though, is Paul is passionate about spreading the gospel. Paul is passionate about investing into people's lives. And and this is what we're going to talk about today, is our passion for investing in others. Paul had this passion that, that not only did he go and he preach, not only did he move on to preach somewhere else, but he wrote letters back because he wanted to make sure that he continued to invest. Have you ever had someone in your life that, that you were close to, maybe a teacher, uh, maybe a mentor, somebody who, who you spent some time learning from them, but then a while later they reached back because they cared about you and they just wanted to make sure that you were still doing okay? Man, That's where Paul is. He wants to further his investment. So three things I see in the scripture, and and then I really want to lay lay out what, what I feel like God's been saying to me. Number one, Paul had a boldness that came from God. We touched on this last week. Paul had a boldness that came from God. He says in verse two, we've previously suffered. We've been treated outrageously in Philippi. And as you know, well, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. See, if Paul were in this for his own reputation or his own safety or his own well-being, he would have never gone to Thessalonica. He says, I knew what I was walking into. I knew the opposition I faced. I've already faced it in other places. But God has given me a boldness to go and share the gospel, to share my faith with you. We can be confident as we invest in others. I think I talked about this a little bit last week, but, but the truth is we're going to face some opposition as we start to share our faith. It may not be people trying to persecute us. It may not be people trying to throw us in jail. But if we are trying to share our faith with others, that's not going to come easy. I believe that the devil does not want us to share our faith. And so I believe that there are obstacles put in the way. And we see this with Paul. He says, guess what? I had a boldness that came from God. This is important. We see this in Paul's other writings as well. His boldness doesn't come from his own authority. His boldness doesn't come from his own ability. His boldness doesn't come from his own confidence. His boldness comes from God. And this is pretty important. Because if our boldness is found in ourselves, in our own ability, and in our own authority, and it's 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 not worth much. But Paul's boldness came from God, so he was able to face anything. See, if our boldness comes from ourselves, the second we start to face opposition, we're gonna be knocked down. But Paul knew that he had boldness from God who was bigger than the opposition he faced. So God gives us boldness to share Christ with others. Man, number one today, I pray that God would give every single one of us the boldness to share our faith. Even if we're sharing it in the face of strong opposition, that God will make us 
bold, not a weak church, not a weak group of Christians who are, who are passive, but a group of followers of Christ who are bold because we've got the power of God behind us and the gospel. Number two, Paul talks about his credentials and his motivation. Verse three, for the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. I love this part. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. Two things there. We speak as those approved by God and entrusted with the gospel. Approved by God, entrusted with the gospel. Let me ask you a question. What made Paul approved by God? What makes you and I approved by God to share the gospel, to share our faith? Think about it for a second. What gave Paul the, the ability to say, I am approved by God? Is it his talent? Is it his achievement? Is it his perfect record? Is it what he's accomplished? Is it any of those things? No. Paul is approved by God, not because of anything he's done, but because of what God has done in Paul's life. We are approved by God because of God's grace and God's transforming work. The greatest qualification you have to share your faith is the transformation that God has made in your life. Let me say that again. This is so important. The greatest qualification you have to share your faith is not anything of your own. It's the work that God has done in your life. And the most powerful testimony is not one that's spoken eloquently or, or masterminded perfectly. It's a testimony of God's transformation in our lives. We are approved by God because God, God's grace and God's love and God's salvation have been made available to us through Christ. There are some of you here today that would say, I don't feel approved by God. I don't feel like I would have the authority to say that. But if you're a follower of Christ today, you are approved by God because God is at work in your life and God's spirit is at work in and through you to build the kingdom. We are approved by God, not because of anything we've done, but because of God's great grace and mercy and love and salvation. We are called to share the gospel. We are approved by God. God has invested in us. But the second part of this is huge too. God has entrusted us with the gospel. So we're approved by God, but we are entrusted with the gospel. Notice the words there. God has entrusted us with the gospel. I want you to hear that differently. With the gospel. The, you know, the Ohio State. You know, we don't want to get you confused with the other Ohio States. This is the Ohio State, right? God has entrusted us. He's approved us through his grace, his mercy, his love, his power. And he's entrusted us with the gospel. Not just any gospel, not just a gospel. We have been entrusted with the gospel. God's plan, God's work in our lives, in the world, to make all things new, to restore all things, to build his kingdom. We're entrusted with that. Listen, I, I don't take it lightly to get up here and preach to you. I don't take it lightly to get to share and look into God's word. This is a heavy thing. This has been heavy on me all week. Because I don't want this to be my gospel I want this to be the gospel. I don't want to preach you my views. I want you to hear from God. If you're hearing my views, you're in big trouble. Because I'm not much. But God's gospel, the transforming work and grace and love and power of God are so amazing 
that if I can just be a conduit for that, there's nothing better I could do. We are entrusted with the gospel. We are approved by God through his work. We were entrusted with his gospel. Man, we got some good stuff to invest in others, don't we? We've got some good stuff to invest. The third thing we see is Paul's integrity. Look, at, look again here. It says, we are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know that we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ we could have asserted our authority. Paul points out two things here. Number one, Paul is not in it for popularity. He's not in it to please people. He's not in it for approval from others. Paul is not in it to be liked. Listen, I really like, I like to be liked. That, that's a confession of mine. One of my weaknesses is I'm a people pleaser. I am. I want people to like me. But I'm not approved because people like me. And I'm not entrusted to be liked. I'm approved because of the grace of God and I'm entrusted with the gospel and so Paul says, we weren't in it to get flattery. We weren't in it to get popularity. We were doing this for the gospel. Uh, I'll never forget, I, had a, I was here as um, junior high youth pastor in uh, 2003 to 2004. And I had a group of kids that I really loved and I really invested in. And I remember three of the guys that I was really close to came out to South Carolina after I moved to visit me. And they stayed for a few days. And, and one night, um, we were hanging out, and these guys were a couple years older then, so they're, they're in high school. Um, you know, I know that they're at school, they're, they're hanging out with kids, they're popular, they're athletes, and so we're hanging out there, and we're having a lot of fun. And, and one night, we were going to watch a movie, and I had to go to bed, but, but I allowed them to start watching this movie that I knew I shouldn't be letting them watch. It wasn't anything... It wasn't anything super terrible, but it was something that, that I didn't want to be responsible to be the one that allowed them to watch something that didn't glorify God. But at the same time, I struggled because I, I wanted to be the cool youth pastor. I wanted to be the guy that, that was cool, that they liked. I wanted to be the guy that, that they looked up to and they thought, man, we, we love hanging out with him. I wanted them to want to come back. And so I put the movie on. I, I said, I got to go to bed, guys. And I went upstairs and I laid there and I thought... Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I can't care more about what they think of me than pointing them to Jesus. And so I made a really hard call and I walked down the steps and I said, guys, I, I'm really sorry. But I just don't think that this glorifies God. And I'm sorry that I even thought about having you guys watch this. I don't want to be, I do want to be liked. I do. But I don't want that to be the driving force between, behind my purpose of sharing the gospel. I don't want the gospel to get messed up by my feelings or my desire to be liked. Paul says we weren't in it for that. He says we weren't in it for greed. This one's simple. If, if you're in sharing the gospel for, for greed, for money, you're in the wrong business. Paul says we weren't just trying to get popular, we weren't just trying to get, we weren't greedy, we weren't trying to get money, we weren't trying to take care of ourselves, we weren't motivated by those things, we were motivated by God. He says, God is our witness, we were trying to please God. And so, this is important. It's not just about investing in others. But it's about our motivation for investing in others. If we are investing in others to be liked, to be popular, for greed, to build something, if that's what we're all about, if it's about our reputation, it's about who we are, if it's about us, we're missing it. We're blowing it. And there's a couple reasons this is so important. Because when we make sharing our faith about us and about what people think of us and about our security, guess what? 
the gospel, the faith that we have, all of a sudden is changed by what we need to do to be liked and to be secure. We're not willing to preach the gospel as it's supposed to be because we know that it will cost us what people think. It'll cost us our security. And so we're not preaching the gospel. We start to preach our gospel. And that's just not okay. We should never, ever compromise the truth in Christ. We should never compromise God's truth of grace and love and salvation. We should never change the gospel be, to make it about us just so we can be liked, just so we can be secure. And the good news is this, we don't have to. The reason Paul could be bold to walk into the face of opposition, the reason Paul didn't worry about what people thought, the reason Paul didn't have to worry about his security was because he knew that it all came from God. It all comes from God. And so when we share our faith, we have to make sure that we're doing so from God's agenda, not our own. So what does this mean? It means we have to speak the truth to people. It means we have to speak truth. Number two, it means we can't add to it. We can't make this our gospel. I, I think sometimes we're guilty of that. I think sometimes we add to the gospel. We, we share our faith, but we add things to it that are more about us than God. Number three, we cannot make this about us. Listen, investing, you know how investment works. You've got to be wise in your investments. And if, if we are investing in others for our own agenda, we're, that's a bad investment. That is a bad investment. Why is it a bad investment? Because when we preach anything less than the gospel, we receive less than the gospel. And we're giving less than the gospel. Listen to how this works. If this is about my popularity, if this is about my security, and so I'm preaching less than the gospel to take care of my popularity and my security, guess what I get? Maybe some popularity. Maybe some security. But I'm missing out on the greatest love, the greatest security that I could ever have in my heavenly Father. And if I'm investing in others with a false gospel, with something less than Christ, then they're going to walk away with less than Christ. They're going to walk away with a false gospel. And so here's where I'm at. All week I've struggled with this message. I, I wrote it on my normal time Thursday night. I wrote it and I went to bed and Friday I woke up and I thought, nah. Eh, Something's off. Friday night, I got back to it. I looked at it. I tried to make some tweaks. I went to bed Saturday morning. I woke up and I thought, something's off. I'm missing something. Saturday night, I worked on it again. And, and it was already written, but I'm working on it. And I'm, I'm thinking, what do I need to do here? And I, I worked for another hour or two last night. And I thought, I, I'm just not getting it. Maybe I'm missing something. And so I went to bed and, and I said, I'm just going to pray about this. And I opened up the scripture. And right before I went to sleep, I, I prayed. I opened up the scripture and I read this again. And you know what struck me? Paul isn't sharing his faith because he has to. Paul isn't sharing his faith to build popularity because he needs popularity. Paul is sharing his faith because he's so passionate about the gospel because God has changed his life. And so if I'm going to speak about truth, I need to speak truth. Church, we need to fall in love with the gospel again. We need to fall in love with God's transforming grace and power and love to the point that Everywhere we go, we want to share our faith. Because I'm afraid as the church, 
We're worried about our own gospel. We're worried about programs. We're worried about buildings. We're worried about what kind of music we sing. We're worried about getting our way. And I'm afraid we're missing the passion and the power of the gospel. And so today, more than anything else, and last night I was convicted, I'm not, I'm not stepping on your toes, I'm stepping on my own toes. Because far too often, my concerns and my thoughts are not about God's agenda, but my own. What I want to see happen. What I think needs to be done. And, I, and I'm, I don't think I'm a bad person. I don't think that's coming from an impure place. I just think sometimes I miss it. And I think sometimes we as followers of Christ miss it. We have the greatest news we could ever have. The almighty God, the creator of the universe, loves each and every one of us. Loves us so much that he sent his son, Jesus, to die on a cross. But Jesus didn't just die. Jesus rose again and defeated sin and death. That's our gospel. And so we have something to share. And if we're more worried about what the music sounds like, then we're worried about sharing our faith with others. If we're more worried about what kind of chairs or carpet or anything, than sharing our faith with others. If we're more worried about programs that we like, than sharing our faith with others, then we're missing it. We need to fall in love with the gospel again. It is the power of Christ for all who are redeemed. And so today, I want you to understand that the greatest investment you can make is the gospel of Christ. We have something so valuable to share with the world around us. You have something so valuable to share with the people you run into every day. And it's not just a good church. This is a good church. This, this is a great church. It's not just a great church. It's not just good people that you love to eat with and hang out with and shake hands with. You have the gospel that the almighty God, the almighty God who created everything, who's all-powerful, gave everything so that we could be redeemed and restored and in right relationship with him because God loves us. And guess what? It's not just true for us. It's true for the people outside the walls of the church. It's true for the people at work. It's true for the people that are pressing your buttons every day. God loves them. And we have a gospel to share. And so I, we got to fall in love with the gospel again. How are we going to do that? Number one, I think we need to know our value in Christ. We need to know just how much God loves us. We need to know that our approval, our love, our need for acceptance doesn't come from others. It comes from God. We need to know our value in Christ. Number two, we need to find security in Christ. Not in money, not in houses, not in jobs, not in fame, we need to find our security in Christ and learn to trust his grace. How do we know the gospel? Well, these two are out of order, but we need to study Jesus. Go ahead and pull them all up there. We need to study Jesus. We need to know God's word because that's the gospel that we have to share. And number four, which is number three up here, we need to seek God's direction in prayer every single day. Man, I, I heard from God last night, but I was sitting over there during the music just praying, God, let this be yours. Don't let this be mine. Speak what you want to speak. Do what you want to do. This is your gospel, not mine. And so today I want us to, to stand together. And I want us to make this our prayer that, that God would reveal to us his love. That each and every one of us would know just how much God loves us. Number two, that God would help us to understand that we have all the security we'll ever need in him. 
My prayer is that you will know God's word, that you will know Jesus because you study it, you read it every day. And I pray that you'll be so close to God in prayer that you'll know exactly what truth you need to speak and when and to who. But the biggest thing I pray today is this, God, give us a passion to share our faith with others. It's too important, it's too good not to share. Father, I pray that each and every one of us would just quiet our hearts and our minds. And as we sing, Christ be magnified. I pray, Lord, that would be our prayer today. And I pray that you would, your Holy Spirit would move among us. I pray that you would light a fire in us, Lord. I pray that you'll give us strength. I pray you'll give us boldness to preach your word, to share your word, to love others. Father, we commit ourselves to you now. In Jesus' name.